On behalf of the St Mary's College Society, of which I am president, may I welcome all of you, whether as a visitor, alumni or members of the college, to this inaugural SMCS lecture. We are indeed fortunate that our lecturer this evening is a person with a truly international reputation. Professor Nancy Cartwright is Distinguished Professor of Philosophy in the University of California, San Diego, and delivered the Carus Lectures in Seattle earlier this year. She first came to Durham as an IAS Fellow and liked it here so much she returned as Professor in the Department of Philosophy while remaining Distinguished Professor in San Diego. She is a member of the British Academy. Among the many outlets for her talents is her work on philosophy and the history of science. If you think philosophy can be a bit abstract, it's not so with Nancy. She is a consultant with the Department of International Development and has, among other things, assisted childcare professionals in their professional development. What she's concerned with as a philosopher is ensuring that policies espoused can make a difference. Aren't we lucky then that <coughs> Professor Cartwright thinks of Durham and St Mary's as her home in term time? We look forward to hearing her on this important subject. I can assure you we are in for a treat tonight. Professor Cartwright, I invite you to give us the inaugural SMCS lecture, Evidence and Policy, Why What Works doesn't work. <laughs> Professor Cartwright. Thank, thank you very much, Elizabeth. It's a, it's a real honor to be giving this lecture. Um, I should say that when I uh, was um, offered the position to move from the London School of Economics to Durham, it was um, part of the deal in my mind that I'd get to live at Mary's. And <laughs> happily, that's worked so far, and it's been wonderful, and I'm very, very pleased to, um, to be able to be, to be here in such a distinguished college with such a distinguished history. Um, so let me begin. Um, the work I'm going to report, um, it probably won't sound much like philosophy. The philosophy is sort of buried underneath. Um, it's a part of our knowledge for use project at the center, center that's located in the philosophy department called the Center for Humanities Engaging Science and Society. Um, and it's about how to use knowledge in policy design implementation and deliberation, how to use knowledge so that policy outcomes are more effective and predictable, more fair and compassionate, and that competing values and points of view are heard and understood and respected. Now, um, my own work over a very long time has been on um, modeling and causation, so I major on thinking about, um, you know, specifically about how to make them more effective and predictable, but you can't actually hive that off from um, the more value-oriented uh, questions, and that's one of the things that I hope um, will become clear as I talk. Now, um, so if you want to make policies uh, more predictable, then what you're doing is... Um, Apparently, um, the current uh, slogan is finding out what works. And the idea that we're all urged is you should use policies that work and don't waste your efforts on ones that don't work. So this big mantra of, of finding out what works. And there are hundreds and hundreds of institutions around the world, mostly in the Anglophone world, um, but and in, uh, uh, has spread uh, to Europe and the European Union, World Trade Organization, World Health Organization. Um, there are hundreds of these organizations that um, try to gather information about and, and distribute it about what works in various uh, domains of social policy. So we have the US Department of Education's What Works Clearinghouse, which was one of the ones that started it. Um, the Cochrane Collaboration, which is health policy, and this is really where it started, started in evidence-based medicine, 
um, and that's the Cochrane collaboration. Um, the Campbell collaboration, which is a kind of um, mimic of the Co uh, Cochrane collaboration for social policy. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Child Welfare Information Gateway. I mentioned that because I'm going to talk a little bit about child welfare, uh, organization of child welfare policy. U.S. Social and Behavioral Sciences Team. This is just some random, not quite, JPAL. Um, that's the JAMAL Poverty Action League, which is um, housed in, um, I don't know whether it's in Boston, it's in, housed in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it's um, full of MIT economists who want to tell you, uh, want to try to figure out what works in development economics, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, here in Britain, <coughs> we have the British What Work Centers. <coughs> And there are a large number of them in health, aging, early intervention, education, crime, local economic growth, well-being. And uh, now we are uh, actually they've given out the uh, they've given out the contract for the group that's going to plan the new What Work Center in child protection. Okay. Now, if you look there um, at the government's statement uh, in 2013 about what the core functions of the what work centers are. One of the ones, things I want to point out is that they are assessing and ranking interventions. Okay. There we have it again. Show where the interventions are applicable. Um, show the cost of the interventions. Um, now they also do give a nod to applicability. Okay. And applicability, and this is the theme of my lecture, applicability depends on the context of application. And basically, there's l very little attention uh, to the context of application. Um, and that's why what works doesn't work. That's the, you can go home now, right? That, that's the, that, the okay. Um, so what's wrong? Okay. Well, what's wrong is that these take um, what I've come to know. I've, I've come to, I think it's a, this is an easy way to divide things, uh, it's not a natural division, but um, you, can, you can understand a lot of what's going on if you make this division. Do these take what I'm calling an intervention-centered approach? That is, they focus on intervention outcome pairs. Okay. Um, and it's not a context-centered approach that focuses on the underlying structure that affords intervention outcome pairing. Uh, but context matters if you want a, a, a policy to work. So um, context can matter for two different kinds of reasons, very practical reasons. Where you will, will the policy actually achieve the intended outcomes, which after all might not be the right outcomes to begin with, but at the moment we're just focusing on the, um, the what work centers don't worry so much about choice of outcomes. They worry about, given the outcomes, you know, what kind of policies will deliver them. Uh, but context matters for practical reasons and for moral reasons. Okay. So um, now, um, thinking about context matters, my uh, colleague, he's uh, from the LSE, uh, and he worked as part of the Durham Project on Knowledge for Use. Uh, Hawkins Second Elgin, um, <clears throat> he works on HIV AIDS, international HIV AIDS policies, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, he goes to these conferences, so he's um, he's written about this, and he says uh, that he'll go to these very excited lectures about the latest um, either prevention or help for HIV AIDS problems, and um, you'll hear um, excited, you know, people excited about their research results and what they think they can do, and um, all, the, um, uh, all the wonderful things that will happen if we just roll this policy out um, worldwide <laughs> or all across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and um, so at these HIV AIDS conference talks, Hawkins <coughs> says that it's just <laughs> at the very last that you see, of course, context and adherence matter for getting the right outcomes. <laughs> and he, he thinks, well, it does matter, and it shouldn't be the last thing you come to. Um, so now I thought, um, just to use a, a, a to make this vivid, though, um, I think probably uh, you don't uh, need uh, the, the kind of joke I'm going to give you, but there is, um, you've probably heard about the Deworm the World movement. Um, so, and um, there it is. Um, and it started in JPAL, this Jamil Poverty Action Lab, um, with a 
some studies by an MIT economist. Um, now, why deworm? Well, I mean, it's good for kids not to have worms, that's true. But the reason for deworming the world is that it's supposed to bring about educational benefits. Okay, so the idea is that um, the children will, uh, who don't have worms, they'll be better nourished, um, they'll miss, miss less school, um, <clears throat> the, the, both because they don't have worms, but also they'll be more attentive in school, and because they're better nourished, they'll uh, be more intelligent in their reception of the education they're getting, and reading scores will go up. Say, reading scores is a, sort of an example. That's why to deworm the world, or not just because you know, you'd like to get rid of kids' worms, but, so, uh, but that uh, it'll, it'll help with these other um, down-the-road outcomes. Um, now, philosophically speaking, I'm going to come back to this case, but philosophically speaking, <coughs> the intervention-centered approach makes sense when the intervention has something like an inbuilt tendency towards the outcome, and there's something about the intervention that it's geared towards that outcome. And um, having started my career in physics, um, I always think of physics examples. So I do think that gravity has a, uh, you know, being a massive object, really has a, a, an inbuilt tendency to make heavy bodies fall. And there is something about being gravity that's connected with the outcome, heavy bodies falling, or heavy bodies from being attracted. Um, and so the intervention-centered approach um, makes sense when the intervention has this built-in tendency towards the outcome in question. Um, but does deworming <laughs> have an inbuilt tendency to improve children's educational outcomes? Um, if not, why are we doing the intervention-centered approach on it? So um, here's deworm the world movement. And as I said, it started. Um, it, it, was, it was really this urge to deworm the world uh, is based entirely, was based entirely on um, a study in Kenya. You might know that the, the, the original study um, was um, the, uh, the results, the data were reanalyzed and by a bunch of epidemiologists fairly recently who thought that um, even the study results that were reported uh, about the improvements in educational outcomes um, didn't hold on a reanalysis of the data. And then there was something called the worm wars between economists, roughly the economists and the epidemiologists about the right way to analyze the data. But that was all data from a study in Kenya. Now, um, I think context matters, but I wasn't so sure. So um, here's my granddaughter, uh, Lucy. And she was, um, she's not doing her A-levels. She was doing, uh, preparing for her GCSEs. And we were kind of worried about her results and wanted to improve her score. So, um, well, there's her school. Uh, she went to this uh, posh um, fee-paying school in Oxford. Um, and. Um, I started giving she, her and her friends deworming pills. So <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work for Lucy and her mates at Headington School for Girls. <laughs> so we know that. I mean, context matters, right? And, uh, okay. Uh, what, I, um, what I want to go on and talk about is uh, one of the studies we're doing at my project. Um, and um, it's a, a sub. It's, uh, this was the original work we did. Um, and what I'm going to tell you about isn't actually in this book, um, but it's subsequent to that. But here's the team that did the book. That's Eileen Munro, um, who wrote the UK government's uh, report on child welfare. Um, I think it's 2012 now. Uh, that's me, uh, uh, Jeremy Hardy, um, and Eleanor Montuski. Okay. And we're still working together on these kinds of issues. Now, um, so I want to talk a little bit about context centering and child protection. Um, now, recall that context centering focuses on the underlying social, economic, geographic, and cultural arrangements that afford causal pathways from intervention to outcome. So you're still interested in, um, at, at the moment, the, the, the small, the, the specific question of uh, will the intervention you propose produce the outcome that um, you intend it to do. Um, and the intervention-centered approach 
and it tends to think about the intervention, you know, and it does studies on the intervention, and looks at the intervention outcome pairing, context-centered, thinks about the context, um, and what kind of causal pathways they'll afford. Now, and it's a systems approach, um, as in Eileen Monroe, who claims child protection is a systems problem. So I want to uh, talk a, a bit about that. Uh, the traditional learning method in child protection uh, that we've used here in Britain uh, for eight ages is <coughs> the serious case review. Uh, and it's used when a child known to child welfare services is killed or seriously injured. And I don't, we don't have to think about uh, the, any particular cases. Um, now, it has problems. Uh, and the uh, problems are that this, uh, um, the serious case reviews have uh, almost always been person-centered. Well, that's intervention-centered. The person uh, who is at fault <laughs> is the intervention. And um, I suppose I should say as an aside, what Eileen points out is that, um, I mean, of course, when the parents harm the child, it's the parents who harm the child. But nevertheless, when you're thinking about um, uh, tracing, uh, the, uh, doing interventions, it's looking for the person in the system who allowed that to happen. So uh, it's, uh, it is kind of odd uh, intervention outcome pairing because it's not actually the, the real intervention, uh, what you did to the child, the parent did to the child uh, that brought about the harm, but rather it's, you're looking for it somewhere else. But it's, um, it's also the serious case reviews rely on causal sequence modeling which is the intervention outcome pairing, and they're accountability obsessed. Mm -hmm. So those are the three problems that we've identified with the standard serious case review method, serious case reviews. And um, the accountability is at least one area <coughs> where moral issues arise. And I want to uh, explain how, uh, in fact, the two, um, the, the intervention centering and the moral issues aren't really all that separable. So Eileen um, tells us when a tragedy occurs, the standard response is to hold an inquiry to get a picture of the causal sequence of events that ended in the child's death. The events that bring the investigation to a halt usually take the form of human error. Human error is blamed in 70 to 80 percent of all major accidents, including child's, child abuse deaths. Uh, this is a statistic that Eileen has found. So, I mean, I suddenly realized um, that I don't actually know where it comes from, so apologies. Um, <laughs> she told me this, <laughs> and I wrote it down, uh, and I should have looked up where, where, how, where, how she knows it. Um, so let's think about this causal sequence, you know, causal sequence, intervention outcome with a causal sequence in between, that kind of modeling. Um, so we've got the intervention, <laughs> right? That's the, uh, the cause, and the outcome <laughs> is the effect. So um, it's also person-centered and accountability-obsessed because, as Eileen says, when you trace the call back, you look for human error. And oddly, we tend to look for human error in the social <coughs> services rather than um, in, the, in the person who actually uh, produced the harm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a better child protection requires, we think, uh, more focus more on context and less on specific interventions, and a different understanding of accountability, and reducing the blame culture. So if we go back to the person-centered, um, the person intervention-centered approach, um, the con conclusions that people who are thinking uh, in that mode, uh, the conclusions that they come to, are that erratic people degrade a safe system, like the head of social services in Herringay with baby, uh, uh, baby P. Um, so, um, so you work on, work on safety requires protecting the system from unreliable people. Okay. So to reduce human error, well, we, there are a number of tactics or interventions that we try in order to reduce human error put psychological pressure on workers to perform better, reduce the human factor as much as possible by formalizing, mechanizing, proceduralizing 
Um, I think they, uh, the, the people who don't like to call it box ticking, right? There's, uh, there's a manual of what to do, and you monitor to make sure that you've done the, the, the procedures, okay? Um, increase surveillance to ensure <coughs> compliance with instructions. All of which, I mean, can work, <laughs> uh, but it has clearly well-known adverse uh, effects. Um, it puts psychological pressure, which drives workers away. So, in fact, there's a large turnover in, uh, in, so in social work in general and in child protection in particular. Um, it creates a blame avoidance culture. So, uh -huh. um, then um, the formalization and proceduralization means that you increase the number of rules, <laughs> which is, increases paperwork and computer work. And while there are so many rules that you spend your time at the computer and not with the families, mm -hmm. okay. um, increase surveillance, um, and among other things, the increased surveillance apart from uh, not making people, the workers feel very happy about their jobs, uh, uh, is that uh, you end up often measuring what's easy to measure and not what's a real measure of what you wanted to see in the first place. Um, so you, know, you, you measure waiting times rather than cure rates. Um, mm. And have you, has the, have you seen the family within three days uh, rather than what did you learn when you saw the family and how did you interact with them? Okay. Um, it takes time. The surveillance takes time, effort, and money. And um, it makes, we think, morally questionable descriptions of blame. So the alternative <laughs> is the um, system-centered <laughs> approach which assumes that individuals are not totally free to choose between good and problematic practice. I mean that um, we are all parts of a social, economic, cultural systems and our behavior is shaped by them. So, um, okay, now if you're gonna take the systems-based approach, then um, we're gonna try to uh, get away from doing this causal sequence intervention outcome modeling, okay? and think instead that social systems are like mechanisms that afford causal processes. You put the system together, the, the parts, the individual working parts together in one way, um, and you get a mechanism that works one way, and you put them together differently, you get a quite uh, different mechanism. So um, compare, I mean my, again, I've got these kind of simple-minded examples that aren't social policy examples, but um, uh, compare different systems uh, in which you can press a lever. So when I press a lever uh, in this mechanism, I get my morning toast. When I press that lever, <laughs> it flushes the toilet. Right? And we all know context matters, so we're not <laughs> the toast our bread in the toilet and press the lever, right? So, um, okay, so the systems-based approach um, uh, is advised to tackle features tackle features in the system that afford poor practice. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, that there's never poor practice and that no one is ever at fault. But um, you look at the system to see what kind, of, um, what kind of features about the system are making it easier for people to make mistakes. Um, so this is James Reason who says, active failures are like mosquitoes. Uh, they can be swatted one by one, but they keep coming. The best remedies are to create more effective defenses to drain the swamps in which they breed. Um, that's the <laughs> what happens when you have the person center and the intervention outcomes centering. Right? Um, you're, you know, you, you've got a problem that comes up. You, you have an inter, you get an intervention, uh, a new rule to, to stop that, and then another rule and another little rule and so forth. Okay. So um, th I mean, this isn't a normal idea that. Um, that we, we've come up with by ourselves. Um, there is, um, for, for philosophers in the room, there is a major lot of work over the last decade on um, mechanisms and causation and um, how mechanisms in a broad sense, I mean, they could be biological mechanisms, like the structure of an acorn, how biological mechanisms give rise to causal processes. And that's philosophically what I work on, is what, how to understand that. Um, 
but it, it's, it is a widespread idea um, in various ways of looking at social policy and what I'm calling the contact-centered approach. So the US National Academy of Sciences has published a pamphlet, To Air is Human, Building a Safer Health System. And it says, the title of this report encapsulates its purpose. Human beings and all lines of work make errors. Errors can be prevented by designing systems that make it hard for people to do the wrong thing and easy for people to do the right thing. Cars are designed so that drivers cannot start them while in reverse <laughs> because that prevents accidents. Work schedules for pilots are designed so they don't fly too many consecutive hours without rest because alertness and performance are compromised. Okay. So that's uh, US describing the um, a contact centered systems approach. You, the UK Department uh, of Health pamphlet, there are two ways of viewing human error. The person centered approach, which is also the intervention outcome centered approach, and the systems approach. The person centered approach focuses on the psychological precursors of error, such as inattention, forgetfulness, and carelessness. <coughs> its associated countermeasures, uh, are, which we've seen, aimed at individuals rather than situations, and these invariably fall within the control paradigm of management. Such controls include disciplinary measures, writing more <coughs> procedures to guide individual behavior, or blaming, naming, and shaming. Well, I also, we also suggest getting rid of the person-centered and the accountability-obsessed <coughs> uh, um, uh, 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 approach. Uh, because uh, uh, child welfare is a systems problem. And if the system is built wrong, people are bound to make mistakes, or it you know, makes it easy for, uh, uh, for us to make mistakes. Uh, and um, I do remember um, over the Baby Peaches uh, <coughs> case, um, the uh, Radio 4 commentator interviewing one of the social workers who said, well, the head of Herring Gay Council shouldn't be blamed, the social worker, it's a systems problem. And he said, but if we don't blame somebody, how will we ever stop this happening again? Right? So he didn't quite have the idea that you could re think differently about the way the, the social, the child protection system um, uh, was uh, is structured to, uh, to correct it. Now, um, so let's just think. Uh, very, uh, very uh, quickly about accountability, um, which is not my, uh, what I major in. Uh, it's the intervention uh, of holding people to account. Okay. It's supposed to, what did this fellow think, the Radio 4 commentator <coughs> think he was supposed to be doing? Well, it's supposed to encourage good practice, identify someone to blame, offer a learning opportunity, and motivate working harder. And that's the the upside of what it's supposed to do. Um, but instead, or in addition, or, or that's the good side when it's working the way uh, people um, uh, who uh, believe in blame uh, you know, hope, um, it can be unfair. So I remember um, uh, seeing, there are various versions of the Billy Budd story. Uh, but um, one that struck me when I was young was uh, where um, the system that ensures somebody gets flogged, so the last person to battle stations, didn't matter how fast they all were, the last person got flogged uh, each time. Um, and um, that's, uh, can, <laughs> that can be unfair, right? Uh, that is unfair. Um, uh, it's frequently ineffective. I mean, that's just what we've noticed again uh, and again. <coughs> um, fear of blame, that's the blame culture, uh, it, uh, it distorts practice. And, you do, you, okay. um, and we know, uh, and we know that, and we know. We, so we do take, uh, in some areas, right? We take uh, st steps to uh, to avoid that. So uh, aviation is supposed to offer anonymity to get pilots to report problems. But if you've got a blame culture, uh, you you know people are afraid to report uh, to report problems. Um, and learning and blame-free cultures is more open, and people are. Well, this is the upside of the other <laughs> way of looking at it. Um, uh, it. When it's working the way it should, people are more motivated to learn and to improve. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences says 
the focus must shift from blaming individuals for past errors to a focus on preventing future errors by designing safety into the system. And Eileen says, um, child protection is a systems problem. Of course, the problem is, and this is, I said, the philosophical problem that um, I mean, I'm approaching as a philosopher, but um, how do you know how to design the system so that it will give rise to the kind of causal pathways that um, we'd like to encourage and discourage the causal pathways uh, that we want to discourage? And I know, for instance, that um, what Eileen uh, Monroe is currently very interested in is something called signs of safety, which is a different way of organizing uh, the child protection system. Um, it's not a different way of intervening in the families, but a different way of organizing the system um, so that um, many, many changes in the system uh, are made at once, but uh, there's more consultation among all the social care workers of various kinds. Um, they do have to meet personally. Um, they, um, uh, sorry, um, it's, um, um, they have to write narratives uh, rather than uh, uh, have preset um, categories that have to give answers in uh, and so forth. Now, the, you know, uh, the kind of interesting scientific and philosophical question is, um, how do we know <laughs> or how do we get a grip on whether or not uh, the kind of reorganization of the social system that Monroe suggests is actually going to do the job that we hope it will do. So it's, it's not as if by shifting, just shifting your focus, uh, you know you know what to do next. Oh. Okay. So I have final thoughts on methods and morals. Um, because they're not independent here. If you if you have a wrong model in one, uh, it promotes mistakes in the other and the reverse. So um, the choice of method has knock-on effects uh, for values. So when things go wrong in social institutions, if you focus on input-output causal sequences, it makes it easy to blame individuals you know, because you're looking for a sort of s s discrete set of steps. You know, this happened and that happened. You know, <laughs> I said this and then I didn't do that and that had these knock-on effects one after another. So if you, if you are focusing on um, causal modeling, um, modeling, um, say, what went wrong, giving you an evaluation after the fact of what went wrong, and you're focused on um, an intervention-centered approach or a person-centered approach or the causal modeling, the sequence modeling, it makes it much easier. That it, it lends itself naturally to ending up with this <coughs> easy to blame individual's failings. I mean, of course, you could trace, you could pick other bits <laughs> in that causal sequence to place the blame, but it's, it, it, uh, it, 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 it tends to support that. And then um, our moral values have methodological consequences because if you're looking for a culprit, uh, for someone to hold accountable, that encourages a focus <coughs> on input-output causal sequence analysis as opposed to uh, an underlying systems analysis. So, uh, a context-centered approach, we think, can do better. Preoccupation with accountability <coughs> with input-output sequences distracts from studying the underlying context. Again, I don't think studying underlying context is an easy job. In fact, I think one of the reasons that we don't go in for it so much, and I know this is the case with, uh, um, with DFID, um, is that we don't have good fixed methodologies for how to do it. Sometimes we do know how to do it, and sometimes we don't. And sometimes we do it well, and sometimes badly. But if you want to do the if you want to do the sequencing, the input output sequencing, um, there are you know you can go to a methodology course uh, in um, the social sciences or in the biomedical sciences, and there'll be you know, quantitative methods, qualitative methods, and we can tell you exactly how to do them, and you can pretty get a pretty good handle on the, you know, the, what's the causal sequence that happened, and, um, and a good handle on you know, how well warranted you are, and assuming that that's, that indeed was the case. Now, if you want to study um, the, uh, instead you say, well, I'd really like to understand the signs of safety, 
and figure out, make a prediction about what kinds of causal processes will really afford the better kinds of causal processes that um, Eileen believes in. I can't give you, I mean, I can't send you anywhere uh, to uh, 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 you know, a, 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 a methodology book that tells you how to do that. Um, I mean, I think that we uh, engineers who build toasters know how to build toasters, <laughs> um, but if you want a methodology for how to do that, um, we we don't have um, uh, uh, we don't have uh, prescri prescriptions um, as we do. So I think one of the reasons that um, we're not uh, people shy away from the context-centered approach is <coughs> that um, it's hard. The other is hard too, but at least you know you, there are pedestrian ways to go about it, whereas this requires uh, more imagination and. Um, also more knowledge of the actual details of the context and how things are working there. Okay. Um, okay. But we know okay, that um, <laughs> we ought to be doing this because changes in context can make both for improvement on the moral side by promoting better chains of responsibility and improved outcomes by affording better processes. Okay. So um, I think it's it's important that we should be devote, devoting efforts to figuring out um, much more about how to follow up a uh, context-centered approach in our what work centers. Oh, I forgot to tell you, since uh, the what work centers are not doing this, okay, um, uh, I tried to find how much we spent on them. And I couldn't find it now. I only spent uh, a few hours. Um, so one, one of the uh, postgrads um, who works at Chess uh, did come up with some figures, but they're not the overall figures. So, um, information from the ESRC. The ESRC continues to commit in the region of 2.5 million a year to its broad what works portfolio. Well, ESRC has attracted nearly 7 million in co funding. Um, information from the big lottery fund 50 million uh, 10 year endowment to the Center for Aging. Um, or the What Works Center for Local Economic Growth was <coughs> funded, had a grant of three million two thousand nine hundred and forty pounds. Um, funding was later extended through 2019, so maybe another two million. Uh, the What Works Center for Crime Reduction, the College of Policing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the Home Office <coughs> spent ten million um, in a fund. The What Works Center for Wellbeing. Funded to the tune of 3.5 million over three years. Initial funding of 4.3 million over three years. Again, the two, the two reports we've got. Anyway, sorry, this is just that I wanted to be able to tell you how much we'd spent on our <coughs> work centers, um, but I didn't find it up. But there, each one of them, uh, there's specific information about. Um, now, uh, <coughs> and the reason for returning to that to, to, at this stage is simply that um, the what work centers are universally dedicated to the intervention-centered approach and are not providing. They would like, I think that it, it's, now, it's now come around to people saying, we don't just want to record what works. We recognize that we should have information about what works for whom when, but then they've no idea how to do it. And, um, and they keep trying to do it by doing more of the, um, causal sequence modeling and uh, intervention-centered uh, approach, just refine it, uh, whereas we think uh, that we ought to be putting <coughs> half that money into a context-centered approach. So morals and methods in child protection, the intervention-centered approach, I think <laughs> they get in each other's way. Okay. Um, and morals and methods in child protection in the context-centered approach, <laughs> they can intertwine in a way that leads to happier outcomes. And uh, thank you. Um, as secretary of the St. Mary's College Society, I would like formally to thank on behalf of everybody here, Nancy, for a fascinating talk. Absolutely thought-provoking, fascinating. As someone who's worked in public service all my life, I do wish there were a couple of government agencies who could go through the same heuristic process as we've all gone through tonight. <laughs> and a wonderful discussion. The first, we hope, of many lectures.
is the society responsible, but what a standard that you have set. And I just want to get a small token of our appreciation. Yeah. And half of the society. Oh, they're already ready. in water for you. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> they are Mary's colours. They're Mary's colours. <laughs> oh, they're from the community. Oh, thank you so much.